Okay, we will bring this uh, meeting to order. Uh, roll call, please. Director um, Shirley? Here. And Chair Lasker? Here. We have a quorum. Um, public communications, anyone in the public want to say anything? I see no public on the board, so I take that to be a negative. Uh, I show no hands. Pardon? No hands at this point. Okay. I want to approve the uh, November 1st finance committee minutes. I'll move that those be approved. I'll second. Okay, we'll move and second. All the public say aye. 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 Item two, discuss landfill equipment guidance system. Who's got that? We have Mr. David presenting today on the landfill guidance uh, system that we've been looking at. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. If I can, can you just bear with me while I pull up the live here and, and share screen. Yes, Rob, we can hear you. Thank you. Oops, if I should share screen first. Our uh, people in virtual land, can you see this slide deck? Yes, thank you. I yes, can see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for double or confirming. Uh, so thanks, Felipe, and, and can you hear me? Finance committee. Um, I have the pleasure today to represent the operations team. Um, my name is David Ramirez. I'm the uh, senior senior engineer here at the district. Um, today I'll be presenting on a piece of a pretty exciting piece of equipment that we are going to be asking the board to approve and add to our system uh, uh, out at the landfill. And I also have uh, Randy Evanger with me, who is uh, one of the landfill supervisor, and I know he's been itching for quite a while to to have this presentation take place and actually get the equipment installed. So we're going to be talking today about landfill equipment guidance system, and is uh, one one thing I hope I'll ask you guys to do is join me on a, a trip down down memory lane. Okay, <laughs> so if you'll build me for a second, um, we can all remember a time when we use one of these, right? The uh, Thomas guide. Which is how we got around in, in 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 the olden days before we had cell phones and GPS on our on our phones or in our cars. And you remember this complicated map? You were you were supposed to look at this map, identify where you were on the map, what page you had to go to, and then when you got to your page, you I remember highlighting the route um, where you wanted to go. But when you actually drove it, it looked a little bit different, right? Uh -huh. so you ended up going, making a wrong turn, not getting that exit that you wanted. So all the plans that you had in the beginning were kind of um, put, put on hold while you tried to re-navigate yourself through, through the city. And that could <clears throat> cause potential conflict, could cause um, some, some hurt feelings in the car. Um, but we all bared with it because that's the way we that's the way things were done. Until we had this great invention, right? We had the GPS that was introduced into the car, and all of a sudden you plugged in your destination, the GPS system would tell you where to go, turn by turn directions, and you could focus on driving. You didn't really have to worry about um, having those arguments as much anymore. <laughs> well, how does this relate to a landfill guidance system? Well, it's pretty much a similar scenario currently uh, as the Thomas guy. Uh, we give our landfill operators a map. We tell them this is where we want to go. We give them a, you know, these are contour maps. We show we, this is the fill area A, fill area B. This is how we want you to build it. But just like the uh, Thomas guy, we end up going in, a, in sometimes in a different route because there's uh, information that the, the landfill doesn't have. They're looking at a paper 2D copy 
they're building a real 3D uh, um, uh, structure. And sad to say, there are sometimes disagreements, things that go wrong, wrong turns, things that need to be corrected along the way. So this landfill guidance system is actually um, going to help us tremendously because this is not the place where you want to be stopping and asking for directions. It's a dangerous location. You want to be focused on the operation of the equipment. You don't want to be um, second guessing yourself. And this is what that landfill guidance system looks like in the cab. Um, on the right hand side, there's a display of what it looks like. You can see the equipment that's there uh, graphically shown. Um, the operator can see their exact location on the landfill, which you can hear northings and eastings, as those are coordinates. Um, then you can also tell what elevation they're at. So you can tell you know, where, where vertically you are. You can also tell how many times you pass over a certain area of, of trash. And that's important to us because um, as we get the trash in, we need to compact it and we need to be able to reduce its volume to maximize the amount of airspace we get out of that um, out of that fill. So knowing how many times you're passing over it will tell the operators, okay, I've already worked that area. I'm ready to go on to another area. Another feature of this equipment is that it can actually tell us how well we're doing compaction. So say we have a set pass count of five. If we actually get compaction earlier than that and with one pass or two passes, the equipment will tell us, you know, you've reached your maximum uh, density for that area, move on to another area. <clears throat> and the different colors you see on here are um, indicating uh, uh, both the number of passes and the, the fill amount that they want. So we can give the operators a 3D model that gets uploaded to this, and then the equipment will tell them, okay, you've filled up to that elevation. You no longer need to be putting more material in here. And that's shown by this hatched area. That's the fill that, that we want to get to. So when the operator gets to that grade, they know to stop. They don't need to fill anymore. Yes. David, how do they know now without this equipment that they've reached that? Good, good question. question. Um, and we're very fortunate to have Randy who has 30, 30 years <laughs> of experience. And really that's, that's the way we are operating off of experience. We do sometimes set um, stakes out there, which are markers that say, you know, from here, we want you to fill X number of feet, but, that marker is in the way of where they want to fill. So it's only a good for, okay, approximately I want to be at that elevation, you know, 15 feet higher than where I am now. And um, so then they, they move on, 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 they work on feel, on, on knowing the, the site. Can you add anything? Yeah, well, they, they use some um, past experience. So the, the, the older folks that taught me how to do the job, they would build it and say, look, Get on there and feel it, look, touch it. This is how it has to be. This is going to be a three to one slope. So you pass this information down. Over time, um, it's going to change a little bit because it's we're all human and a lot of it's opinion based. I think it feels like it did yesterday, but I'm not sure. Good enough, let's go. We, we, we can't roll like that. Um, it's, it is opinion based and there's going to be nine operators out there and a supervisor and we need to have uh, one set pattern that, that we're going to build this pencil with and not go off opinion base. When we have to fall back and have do-overs, it, it's uh, it's very hard on us. It's expensive for the for regen. It's wasting materials that we shouldn't be wasting. And it's nobody doing anything they shouldn't be. It's uh, a lot of work, very fast pace, and you get one shot to get it right. Mm -hmm. Solid waste is far different than, than working in soils. Mm -hmm. it, it's very tough to deal with, and it's not as easy when you have these mistakes to come back and fix it. Does this system require sensors on the ground that may, that talk to this system here? Sure, we'll, we'll get into the specific okay. equipment, but yeah, there there are equipment that's, there's sensors that are mounted on the equipment itself. And then there's a base station. 
and those are communicating with the GPS satellites to, to but anything on the in the on the landfill itself in the ground nothing nothing like set in the ground other than um a, a, a base station so that's giving the you know one point and it's telling them okay i'm at elevation 10 and i'm at uh coordinate X, Y. Okay. And then that's communicating to the equipment. So the equipment checks in with that and says, okay, I know where I am. Is this just a screen that's in the cab of the operator? Yeah. I'll, okay. We'll, okay. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll jump over to yeah. that. Um, thank you, Randy. Um, sorry. Um, so this is kind of to your question, uh, Theo. Uh, so a new GPS sensor will be placed on. Uh, few of the bulldozers and the compactors, and that gets mounted up at the top of the, of the cab. Um, and that sensor is a known distance from the ground. So it can calculate where that blade is um, at, at all times. Um, and then our little satellites are a little bit messed up here, but it's getting that GPS information similar to your car, but a lot more accurate. Um, we're getting vertical elevations to the nearest uh, tenth of a foot and horizontals to almost pinpoint accuracy. I saw the picture as I was walking in the la baby de Javier. She's like, lots of hair. Hi, Berta. How cute. Berta, do you December mind? December 21, right before Christmas. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll try to power through here. <laughs> Um, there's a couple of benefits of the landfill guidance system. We get real-time feedback um, and key landfill metrics like compaction, um, elevations. At the end of each day, we're getting a, a report that basically tells you what was built. Um, also getting uh, refuse compaction, equipment, G GPS locations. So a supervisor or manager can actually see what each piece of equipment is doing, where they are throughout the day. They can play back a day they want they want to go back three months and say well i don't i want to know you know how much time that dozer was operating etc um and then at the end of the day that 3d surface model is available for operators to be able to plan the next day for engineers um uh, op, uh, management directors to be able to look at that uh, information and see how well how well did we do did we get the compaction get, get the airspace um, we, we thought we wouldn't want to get and then, as Randy mentioned, um, reduce the time to rework areas. And this is a big deal in the winter, like times like right now, about the, the storms that come through here really demonstrate, you know, where we need, where our issues are, because the water knows, knows the, the topography better than, than we do sometimes. So this really gives us the topography and information um, that we need to avoid areas that are um, going to cause us problems in the future. And there's a lot of valuable data. This is this thing's going to throw so much data at us of, of, of horizontal, vertical information, run times, et cetera. So there's a lot of data to be mined and metrics to be grabbed from this from this uh, equipment that we can't we just don't have access to it right now. A full qualitative area. Um, I already talked about the reworked, um, improved waste fill build quality will improve our performance during storms, um, improved data communication between engineering and ops. So uh, as much as um, uh, we try to make the drawings as clear as we can, the 2D drawings, they, they're, they're limited. They're, they're 2D. They're, they're um, not everybody can understand those drawings. There's a select few out in the in the landfill and in, in ops that understand what what's being said on those drawings. Um, this really makes all that information accessible to everybody working on on the base. Um, there's a nice feature that we can set up exclusion zones throughout the landfill. We have these wells that are drilled to collect landfill gas, and we don't want to run into those ever. <laughs> and so we can set up and define these exclusion zones that if a piece of equipment gets within 10 feet of that um, well, an alarm will 
Ron, Randy probably wants a 20 feeter, <laughs> but you know, as, as, as you get closer to it, it'll start to alarm increasing intensity of alarm, letting you know you're, you're in, you're in an area you shouldn't be. And those can be set up for a number of different features on the landfill. Um, and again, access to performance data is going to be uh, in, in, tremendous. So we went through and did a quick calculation uh, to find out what the value of airspace we could potentially save and what the value of that airspace could be. Um, currently, we, we, we do a topo topographic map of the landfill once a year. And imagine you're going on a diet and you're only going to weigh yourself <laughs> on January 1st. Right? And you don't know throughout the year what you've been doing, how how well what you what you've changed is is how well how well it's working. Well, similar for us, we're running on a, a topography um, that's done every year with this equipment. We have daily uh, feedback on daily uh, on to the minute um, of how well we are compacting that waste. And so we expect our compaction to really increase and to be able to give the, 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 um, the user, the operator, feedback so that they can evaluate their own performance as they're doing, doing the work. Um, and so this first row, the current is what we get current right now, the compaction density that we get right now. Um, it's about 1,340 uh, pounds per cubic yard. And if we get a 2% increase, which is more than achievable, we believe. Um, the standard is about 0.7. Uh, the other sites, some sites are able to get 0 0.8, 0 0.85. Um, we hope to get to that, um, but at least we, we, we feel like 0.7 is something that we, we can achieve. Um, and with that, once you calculate the amount of saved airspace by just the 2% increase in density, you're looking at uh, a value of conserved landfill volume over on the right of, of um, $644,000 a year of, of saved airspace. And say we did not get this equipment, but yet we wanted the same amount of information, daily compaction numbers, daily fill volumes, daily topography, um, so to get this a, a similar similar information, a two person survey crew, a half a day minimum is about fifteen hundred dollars. We have around three hundred and ten operating days in a year, so that's uh, you know to get the same information to be four hundred sixty five thousand. But you don't do this now. We don't do that now. So this would be an alternative, and we wouldn't get the. Um, the runtime on, uh, we wouldn't get the, the real time indication of where the equipment is. Um, staff wouldn't have real time compaction information. Staff wouldn't have real time um, cut to fill. You know, have they gone too high? Are they, you know, are they at grade? They wouldn't know that. Um, so there's, there'd be a lot of information missing from this. I got a kind of a kind of question. Sure. Um, first of all, this is this is a piece of equipment inside all the compaction equipment, right? Mm -hmm. The uh, dozers and com compactors, okay. yeah. So the information is being presented, who's making a decision that they stop, don't stop? Is it, is it the operator? Is there somebody on the outside supervising this operation, looking at the same equipment, telling the operator to either do more or do less or do something different? No, when they when they get the file in the morning and they, they start to place and pack the waste, uh, it'll have a certain color, so it'll be blue. Their screen will be blue, which indicates a fill. If they over overbuild it, it will become red. So that means you have to cut it. When they're right on grade, it turns green. So the operator is making that decision. Yep. So what is the supervisor, uh, the the leadership? How do they? What part do they play in the decision making of doing something or not doing something? We'll we'll be putting together the the fill sequencing where our roads are going to go, how we're how we're going to build certain aspects of the landfill to make sure it all comes together. With the least amount of disruption or, or having to uh, uh, go outside of the norm to build roads or something because something happened that we didn't think of. So there's another uh, screen that's being monitored by somebody. Uh, sure, we can we can have it up on the screen in the offices too. In and the office, also, how about on site? 
there as well? I think if on the laptops, I think we can put them on laptops and if we can get um, service out there, then we can we can bring it up in the field too. I, I think it may be a little more hands-off than you may be uh, in, interpreting it right now. So we build the model before. So engineering and ops work together to say, we're filling um, area A with 15 feet of fill, it sloped at 2%. We have a road going down in this area and that model gets uploaded to the machines. Okay. And then the operators are driving around, they see that model. And what this equipment is doing is saying, okay, here, you need to add a little bit of fill over there, not as much. So it's it's giving them feedback of like, right, right now, they don't need to call up to engineering and say, where would that road <laughs> need to be? I need some stakes put out here so I can tell where that road's gonna be. That model's at their fingertips mm -hmm. And they see it on their screen in the compactor and know, yes, we've hit uh, the design. So, okay. So the operator is actually um, working to accomplish a design that's made by somebody else. Correct. Right. A, a 3D model that's yeah. built on, on the AutoCAD sure. in, 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 in our office at engineering. We've consulted hopefully three months in advance mm -hmm. of what the fill is going to be in that area. Mm -hmm and um, then deliver that model to the operations. Operations builds that model, they see an issue, then you know, Randy and I are, are talking, hey, that road's not actually gonna work going that way. There's, there's a flaw that we're seeing in the field real time, or we're getting so much waste that um, if we go one more day, we're gonna overshoot this, this, this design. So we need to pull up the other design for this other area. It's a, this is a powerful uh, piece of, Information that's available, oh, yeah. and I can, and when you have a system like that, sometimes you got to worry about what's the transfer of information from one point to the other in terms yeah. of who's doing the work and who's planning the work, yeah. and how, how how hard to integrate it together, and making sure that the plan is going along. You know, I, if I was an operator out there, I'd say, "Cal, I, this is pretty neat. I'll just go out and do my thing," you know. <laughs> Turn my cell phone off. <laughs> David, can you ship with them the learn time for the operator? I think I had the same kind of similar questions as him, and that kind of put me at ease because I wanted to see how difficult is it going to be for the operator to comprehend the design that's being passed down. And I think it was a nominal nominal time for an operator to learn how to use it. That was that was another question I had is what's the uh, how long does it take to train uh, an equipment operator to to, to work this equipment? And interpret, you know, correctly interpret the information that needs to be provided. Yeah, um, Randy's been, Randy's and and I have gone to a couple of sites where they have this equipment, and we'll go over that as well. But Randy's talked to people who actually done it in the CAD. Um, you have, yeah, yeah, it, it's. Uh, I mean, everybody's a little different, right? Our, our learning curves are a little different, but it, it's it's very very simple because the operator's not having to design anything. They're basically the analogy I share with them is we're just going to color the coloring book. We have three different colors. It's it's really going to be that simple, and it's, it'll tell them within seconds if you've overbuilt it, your compaction's ready, and so there's no uh, there's no do overs and whatnot. So they won't be designing. Uh, there'll be the uh, only thing they'll be inputting into there is if they do come across a, a gas line that was missed, um, then they can. Plug it into their computer too, and it automatically send it up to the offices, um, indicating that we we have a new uh, exclusion zone, and then we can get to work on figure out what happened. You indicated this is that it's being used at other locations. Yeah, yeah, so a lot of them. Is the is, is the equipment pretty dependable? Yeah. Yes, it was, it was very dependable. Their uh, Altamont Pass up in the Bay Area has an old system. Um, uh, I'm not even sure how old it is. It's probably around 15 years old, but they're still using it. Mm -hmm. And all of the the tech support, um, and because we had we had questions about that. What what if we need some support? And everybody's had very good very good things to say about them. So there's offsite tech support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we went to um, uh, a landfill in Santa Maria, and went in Fresno to go visit them and talk to their management, talk to their operators, and how they use use it and how it um, made a difference at their landfill. Is there spares that you could have that let's say you know a piece of equipment on the on a compactor goes bad? Can you just plug in a, a, a replacement and just you know, and somehow another 
get it up to speed with what's going on? Yeah, it's 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 really simple on the equipment side. The sensors themselves are replaceable. It's the wiring is already in there. You know, plug it, put the, put the new one in. Okay. Um, really, it's it, the brain of it is this design file that gets uploaded to the uh, to the equipment, and they're they're communicating with the I'll call it the the central brain. <laughs> Um, and what are you through? Uh, it's well, it's a cloud system, so they're communicating okay. on the internet. So if I one you know midday think, okay, I know that road needs to change. Okay, I'm going to turn it you know 30 degrees, and and that road's going to go this way. And then I hit the uh, upload. That real time goes out into the field within minutes. And they're working on the new design, so it's communicating through um, cell service towers. So they're getting all that information real time. Um, so the equipment itself, the the sensors, are really just a means to an end. They're they're just the portal in which the information gets communicated. Is there is there any additional staff required to operate this system? There is a a. a Somewhat of a somewhat of a new task that the engineering department has to do, which is the uh, the building of the three D models. But we've been st we've started that process already of of doing the uh, these quarterly fill sequence plans and working with ops mm -hmm. as as a um, warm up to get to to get to this system. So the the um, Knowledge is already in the engineering department. We have the capabilities. We have the AutoCAD. We have the knowledge how to use AutoCAD. So the short answer is no. What's that? The short answer is no. You don't need any other people. No, we, we won't. Okay. So one thing also, we've um, the the vendor has given us access to the data. They did a flyover, uploaded all the data. So we'd have about like, three months of trial with all the, the software the bill you know well that's that's the um that's the the drone, drone. The drone which is yeah. separate than this one is there some licensing requirements licensing yeah there's there's a program license to get access to the cloud mm -hmm. of subscription that that will okay go over. that's the only one that requires a license it's yeah it's just the carlson command and it's all in one uh computer system where you upload um, you can track, you can manage the screens that the operator sees, customize what they can see, what they can't see, et cetera. Lots of, lots of features. But you in engineering have some control that you can modify and make changes as needed? Well, with, with consulting with ops, it's really an, an ops tool. The engineering piece is building the design and working with the, with the, um, with the ops team to make the design. Once that design is delivered to ops, if there's a problem with it, we'll communicate. But really, we're engineering wouldn't monitor on a daily basis where the equipment is. Um, if we need to extract data, we can. So on a on an operational basis, on a daily basis, you're in charge. That's right. Okay. Unity of command. Internet is a great lot, training tool too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unity of command. Right. It's a great training tool too because we can do playback. It's really hard when a boss would ask me um, what happened in November of last year. <laughs> but if we can do a playback and I find somebody was not being the best that they can, they're putting the waste in too fat and running over the top, I can bring up a bar graph and show them and use it as an educational tool. Okay. Um, we'll also figure out how to mark in there. Um, if I see an anomaly in those graphs and I run out there and ask what's going on, there's a big stump that went in there. We need to figure out how we can mark this as this is a bulky oversized item and then that way everybody knows and that's why there's a an anomaly in our in our bar graph but it'd be a great training tool too so moving on to the slides we kind of talked about a lot of this uh, as we've been going but um, this is the package that we asked to get quoted by the the vendors that supply this we have three three compactors with GPS um, kits. Uh, we have three bulldozers with the GPS kits. Um, Why are the bulldozers much cheaper than the other ones? Well, the the compactors, the compactors. I forget what they they required a bit more wiring. I think that's what it is. The yeah. the installation 
of the wiring is a little bit more. Um, but I can't recall why exactly there's that that slight difference. And the boss could say it's bottom one, right? This is the command rover, so they will have like a surveyor uh, uh, rod that can give them, you know, say you're in a pickup truck and you want to know, okay, wh where I want to mark this well. Uh, you don't want to drive the compact rule there to go mark it. So you come and you, you have a survey rod, you punch it in, that mark, that that well is marked. You, we, you know, the operations team almost becomes a, a survey, internal survey crew, um, and we can transmit that information to consultants, to for designers. Where is that, where is that Carlson and rover located? So the rover is is portable. So it can be in a um, pickup in a pickup truck. truck. Yeah, the base station is the uh, stationary unit that is on a set known point. And that we have to discuss internally where we're going to put that so it can be protected. It can be moved, but you but want generally to, it'll stay in one. Generally, place. it'll stay in one place for a given amount of time, and you, you'll want radio connection sure. to that piece of equipment. So if there field changes to another spot. You may have to move that base. Is that all line of sight stuff? Not necessarily. You get better um, data and better um, correlation of the elevations if you have line of sight, but it can it can do some some bending, but you generally want to avoid it. Um, installation and training uh, also included in the price. Is the vendor doing the training? The vendor is doing the training, yeah. Um, How long so that take? The training? Yeah. Um, I think it's pretty simple. It's really internal discussions of what we want the product to show in the inside of the cab. Do we want them to see the cut and fill information, compaction, pass counts? You know, do you want to overwhelm them with a lot of data or just really simplify it? Does the training include uh, not only classroom type stuff, but period of time when they're when it's being in, implemented in the field so i think it's, it's really it's really in the field okay. uh, and as i've heard the training goes as uh, you know they say this is the basics go use it right. for a week mm -hmm. and then we'll talk again and build and see what do you like what don't you like because it can be customized a bunch of different ways. you'll get a lot more questions after the the operators yeah. use the system for a week yeah. first just introduce it to them you got any questions overwhelm they, them they don't, <laughs> they don't know yet i won't know yet but they're give us a week and we'll have a bunch of questions when you uh, went to visit other locations that have this what are their how how is it accepted among the folks that are actually using it for their, for their uh, attitude. The the I think everybody's attitude is great. And one operator in uh, at American Avenue in Fresno um, said that we should have had this a long, long time ago because it, it, you get these these old guys and they know how to do it the old way, like me. And you give them this new instrument, and it actually helps them. And then pretty soon the old guys are saying, you know what, this is better than relying on me. Because everybody can do it, and we're all doing it the same. And there's a couple of operators who are like, if if we when we were uh, demoing them, the the engineer who was mess like kind of messed with their screen a little bit, changed it, and then they as soon as he moved it, they're like, "Hey, what are you doing with my screen? Why are you changing yeah. my screen? I need it. Uh, you know what's going on?" So they get married to it pretty quickly. That's yeah, what, yeah, that's they, what it they really enjoy it. That's yeah. the feedback that I've received from them. So we there's a number of products that are available on the market. There's um, and we investigated uh, quite a few of them. Um, there's uh, Carlson machine control, which is um, preview. We that's the one we like. Uh, then there's Trimble, which is a big name in in GPS and surveying in general. Um, Geologic computer systems. This is a smaller outfit. And Topcon, which um, is is really just for grading. It gives them really just vertical elevations. The one we really liked was Carlson um, and Trimble. They're, those were the two that seemed like they they were closest to meeting our needs. Um, and as uh, Randy mentioned, we went out to Santa Maria uh, Regional Landfill, which has the Carlson. Um, I think I got these switched, right? I actually actually- Fresno I, has the Carlson. Fresno has the, the Carlson. Yeah. So these are actually okay. switched. So the bottom. Um, so Fresno actually has the Carlson system and Santa Maria has the Trimble. 
I'll get this fixed for the show. Is that the kind of description? Yeah. Hello. All screen that's inside the cab looks like it's only about 10 inches square. Yeah, and that's you can make that screen pretty simple or add a lot of information. I think uh, the size was not really an issue. I think they were able to get the, the core information on that screen. You can also change the screen. So if you you know you want to be operating in the morning with with one screen knowing elevation, but then uh, you you you've dealt with the waste now you're compacting it you may want to change to the to a compaction screen that's you know specific to what you're doing there's lots of lots of options um you know i i have eye issues as mm -hmm. i get older I, my issues get worse but you know a, a dozer operator has good usually has good far vision for something like this requires gear vision uh, I don't know if that'd be an issue or not. I mean, I couldn't use it, but <laughs> maybe if you're 40 years younger, you can. Yeah, I haven't I haven't heard that that's been an issue from from operators, but um, we have to. I guess you wear glasses and still deal with. That just occurred to me when I saw that side. I said, "Whoa, that'd be a problem for me." Yeah. You know, put it on the front of the hood, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See a longer arm. That's where I'm at now. <laughs> Um, so we we looked at the two shortlisted products and went into the uh, conversations with those vendors about the cost of the Carlton system with with the information and and, and uh, equipment that I talked about was about three hundred fifty four thousand and the Trimble system was about three hundred sixty nine thousand um, and the budget for this year uh, expenditure was uh, on this topic was uh, five hundred thousand. I don't remember seeing that on the budget. That was it. Was, was it? Was what was it called? If you were the GPS, I don't remember. I think it was GPS. Yeah, GPS. Yeah. I don't think. Uh, and we we wanted to recommend Carlson Machine Control as the as the recommended vendor. Carlson um, really really um, hit Regen's needs. Um, well, let me back up a minute. Uh, we based our, our equipment selection on on the following uh, basic uh, essentially our our needs what we needed to get from the system based on our site visits to view the two different pieces uh, our um, programs um, we talked at nauseum with the with the vendors to really dial in do is this is this really the right system for us and I think we had probably half a dozen or so conversations with the vendor um, going over this going over this stuff and we confirmed that it works with our CAD system, our civil 3D um, modeling software that we have. It is that it, it, it's are compatible. Two. Yeah. Um, I got two questions. One number one is what's what's the um, from the time you tell them to start, how long does it take to implement this, including the training? So they told us it was about two or three months to be able to deliver the equipment and then get get trained on it. So we're probably looking at uh, second quarter of this year once we give them the go ahead second point i have is it's more for rob is this considered professional services or is this a uh that was a contracting issue the legal issue is there an issue there so we we talked with this it'd be like an equipment vendor um so we were able to discuss with them about a um, cooperative purchasing agreement through the state of minnesota and so um it's it's really like an equipment purchase um the the soft it's a software and hardware um we're doing the internal designs and uh so it'll fall under the purview of professional services we're not required uh firm fixed price bids type thing well we um we didn't go out Compet to competitive we hold on let me back up so <laughs> we did go to uh, uh get informal bids from uh the vendors um and we in discussions, we found that the Carlson software was the least expensive, and then we found out that the Carlson system was registered under a cooperative purchasing agreement for public um, entities, oh, which is the Minnesota um, Cooperative Purchasing Agreement Never system. We had any of that, but it's similar to Sourcewell. Yeah, if you're familiar with Sourcewell, where you can these are pre-negotiated. Sure. Um, the equipment that when bought in mass by public agencies, the vendor gives a discount. 
So in addition to being the least expensive uh, equipment, we're also getting an additional discount based on this cooperative purchasing um, program. This is a, uh, from my perspective, this is a uh, kind of quantum leap forward in operation. Uh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was going to ask, why haven't we done this before? So in the past, we've debated about it because of the life of the, uh, not the, the amount of waste that the landfill has been receiving. Um, didn't, wasn't really, um, wasn't matching the, the investment that we thought we were going to uh, make. Um, and the price of equipment, the amount of waste we get, and the um, the need for us to really hone in on on our our um, grades and our compaction and really get that data um, is is really what pushed us forward in into making the proposal in this year's budget. But from, from I mean, it, it's overdue. From mm -hmm. where we were ten years ago in terms of the, all these materials coming straight to the landfill, you know, it's been insisted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so, so you got a lot more stuff going directly to the landfill now than you did before right uh, i mean is, is it like double triple quadruple um Garth could probably speak to it better he's seen the graphs but it's it's somewhere near that i, I think in the over 15 years it's doubled I, I, it's over 10 years yeah. so what your, but your point is that uh you know 15 years ago we could do this Manually, basically. Uh, now the volumes are getting submitted. You have to control it more carefully, and and we have more real time grasp on how this stuff is going in, how it's being compacted, and manage it. Yeah, uh, it's kind of gone past the uh, intuitive or the ability to be able to do this. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Sure, and enough momentum got built up behind it where we we we've, we've learned enough about the equipment. I know Randy's been talking about it for a while, so we're. Really so you happy have, to happy to you know yeah. present this and, and to get it up and running. So your ROI on this is based upon the fact that you've been maybe more carefully manage the compaction and airspace going forward, which is where your return on investment is coming from. Uh, yeah, and we can measure it in terms of the saved airspace as I as I did before. Um, but a lot of the information. To, to calculate the ROI is hard to get because we don't have a way of tracking. Yeah. We don't have a way of tracking compaction real time. We don't have a way of knowing how much time we've spent reworking an area because um, nobody's keeping that that really detailed data to be able to look back. Um, so this is like you're saying a big quantum leap in information that we're getting, and we can run real. ROIs on a bunch of different those, scenarios. Those big grabs that were just, you know, stood out to you right off the immediately was one was the landfill space and the way of 100 years of life and we compact better is that now 120 years of life. So we'll be able to make that determination. Yeah. One is the rework and overtime and, and even frustration that, that occurs when we have to rework, right, Randy? Yes. Uh, you know, I've been here now one year. And so... <laughs> So, I'm, you know, I saw those as really uh, extraordinary. And one thing we haven't heard in here as well is the improvement in our environmental protection. Although we're already pretty stellar when we get our visits, this will just help improve those areas. Like Randy says, the, the rain tells no light. It really tells us where our inefficiencies are at. And we think we can improve with the system and then get the return on investment mm -hmm. and also create uh, maybe another pathway of, of dollars being saved, in, and that's operational expenses. And that's being efficient at what we do, because uh, you'd hate to go run a route, pick up 800 homes, and then have to go back for the one home. Right. It takes you two hours to get when it took you eight hours to get 800. So right. you really start measuring those uh, that you really can't pencil in without being creative. But I think this system will start giving us pathways to start penciling in what those actual savings could be. Or, or or quantitate to uh, in the future. So I'm pretty excited yeah. about it. This equipment is operated kind of a, uh, uh, you know, kind of a harsh environment. It's outside, it's in the rain, it's bouncing around on top of the dozer. Is it pretty durable? Yes, it's very durable. The only thing outside the machines will be there, the, the, the antennas that are on the ropes of the machines. You have to get spares? Um, we haven't heard that, that, that you need to get spares. Okay. One goes down okay. there. Yeah. So the, the other machines you might see with on the corners of the blade, they'll have some mass, some poles coming up. We, we won't have those at all. Those are just dirt machines. 
is you're right, the solid waste environment is probably the harshest you can imagine. Yeah. So everything has to be very protected um, because that's going to be their, their pride and joy, their babies, that, okay. that antenna right there. That's quite exciting. Kind of interesting. Like I said, why did we do this? <laughs> uh, so we're, we've talked about the Carlson system already. Um, we felt that it was a comprehensive solution for landfills. Carlson really was built from the ground, ground up for landfills. Right. Um, mm -hmm. The Trimble mm -hmm. system, it's much bigger in the construction industry. Where are they? Carlson? Um, I can't say right now. I don't I, I don't know don't know the answer to that right now. PO box in front of <laughs> no. I, I I can't don't can't tell you. Um I'll get you that information. I think it's Colorado. Matt's out of uh, Arizona, but I think that they're based out of Colorado. Yeah, so we've been working with a vendor. Which which is a uh, a, a, a retailer yeah. of, of Carlson, but Carlson product is 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 a that's the guy who makes the money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we've been talking with the sales team and yeah. somewhat a little bit of Carlson, but um, so I'll, I'll get you that info. Okay. Um, so is the sales team uh, local? Their sales team in in California, right? Uh, Matt was out of RDO. Okay. Um, reflect this the Carlson software uh, gave us um, deflection calculations. So that was this this system where you can tell you if you've met compaction before you've done your number your five number of passes or your, your set number of passes. Um, again, built specifically for landfills. How is it doing that? How is it actually measuring compaction? What what it does? It's it's getting you within you know a tenth. Of the, a couple hundreds of, of a foot of um, elevation. So what it does, you run over it one time. Uh, it it says, way. I've got elevation at 10. You run over it again. It says, okay, now you're at nine, nine, elevation nine. Now you're running over again. Okay, now you're at 8.9. You no, know, you've only, you've only, mm. you're it, comparatively, the deflection of okay. the elevation is only changing. So it's really, it, diminishing returns as you, as you move with the elevation, not, not density. Correct. Right. It's doing elevation as you're doing the pass up. Um, but we, we can take the amount of waste that we put in there and the airspace consumed to, to be able to calculate the densities. Yeah. And that report can be run daily instead of yearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, real time positioning of team movements. So if I'm if in the unfortunate day that I'm running a compactor and Randy's running a compactor next to me, I can see what work he's done mm -hmm. on my screen to be able to know, okay, he's compacted that area and I'm I'm still working on this area. Hey, Randy, I'm really running behind over here. Can you jump over here? He's seen what, what I've done. So you see the same screen? Yep. Yeah, we can see, we can see each, each other's work. work. Done. So if, if he still has a lot of red showing, mine's all green. As it will be, I can go over that. <laughs> I can help Dave out, and then we work as a team to, okay. to make everything really super nice. And that, and I can also see my teammates as graphically inter, uh, shown on that screen if I need it, if I need to. And the training look is like I say is also some field field related as well. Right. So yeah, they'll yeah. come. They'll come install everything. Give us a basic class on it. So you you can't hurt it. Go to work. We'll be back in a week and write your questions down. And the guys will go play with it. And yeah. I'll, I'll encourage them to do everything that you can possibly think of it to do with this and write your questions down. And then we'll we'll have a meeting with these folks and they'll they'll get our answers for us. And we'll be a little bit better tomorrow than we were today. So they don't they don't, they don't go out in the field. Excuse me. Do they go out in the field while they're actually? Up? Yeah, sure. They'll they'll come out on onto the machine as best they can for to give them real time. Application. Okay. We're in May, May, Maysville, Kentucky. Carlson. Yes. May, May, Maysville, Kentucky. Maysville, Kentucky. Well, it's a long ways from Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> Maysville. And as I mentioned, also there's cloud cloud data. So if I make a change in in the office on a design, goes up into the clouds, cloud, and and that data is sent directly to the machines. Within within minutes. So you we have our right. You have to buy a cloud. Uh, how do we get, how do we pay for a capacity cloud capacity? 
So with the Carlson command system, that program and the subscription, it we does. we it comes with it. Okay. There there is a uh, an add on of um, cellular service that each piece of equipment will need to have. And uh, what are they called? Those little chips? A, not a smart chip. Um, a, a cell chip where it can communicate with the cell towers to to transmit information back and forth. Okay. SD card. No, the other cards. SIM card. There. Thank you. They, so we need a SIM card. It gets put into the little uh, display module, and then it can communicate with the other pieces of equipment and commu communicate with the cloud and the extraterrestrial satellites. You don't need a phone phone number for those things, right? How do they, uh... they they do they do get a phone number, so it's a cell service. So okay. um, it's like Verizon or AT and T, and we've been piloting the different um, cell providers. Uh, I'll go down there, Jay will go down there and see which which service provider. We get and with the with the storms and such, we're still evaluating it because those have an impact on the on the uh, provider. But we'll have to pick one because it's going to be dependent upon whatever cell cell service is available in the whole area. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So you don't know which one might be better or more. Reasonable. We're we're piloting them as much as we can with our cell phones. We're doing the download tests mm -hmm. and up and down time, but. If we choose one and it doesn't work, we can switch to another. Yeah, okay. um, there's also other options um, to set up a radio communication, uh, a Wi-Fi network on site, but we don't think we're going to need that. We, we think we're going to be fine with this all service up here. And we're also, we're also piloting a, um, a cellular booster. Those were, I got one of those. Those were nice. Yeah. All right. So um, thank Thank you, David. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Great question. It's fun. I, we could talk about this really in depth. Well, I, they, is it like you take the quantum leap forward from what we've done? You know, it's just, I guess this is what we have to do. It's advanced landfill. <laughs> yeah. Landfill 2.0, right? Yeah. So, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Happy to take so, uh, so, this is on the first board to next board meeting for approval. Correct. Okay. I personally, you know, I, I'm sure there's going to be some shake out requirements and learning curve issues and stuff like that, but it's probably something that we probably need to do. Yeah. So we're down to the board. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think this is great. Your presentation was 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 good at hitting all those spots. Yeah. The, you know, the, the landfill space that we're going to be saving, the money over time, I mean, that is really valuable to see that. So I'm happy you, you had that part in your presentation because that's what I was you know, thinking about. But Good. I love the idea of us being more efficient with our time, with our people, with our space, our land. And so I think this is a great direction to go. It's the only landfill we're going to have in this area. Yeah. It's going to last for our grandkids. Right. So we, we got to start doing due diligence. And yeah. Make, yeah. it, make it last. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well done. I'm excited for yeah. you. <laughs> Happy to present it for on, on behalf of the team. So okay. it's been a real team effort uh, between Jay, Randy, uh, the other engineers that we have here, and, and Felipe's uh, leadership too. So we really appreciate the opportunity to bring it forward. Okay. Next time, biochar technology. Hi, okay. guys. Oh, oh sorry. Hi, guys. Hey, guys. Yeah, good morning. Happy New Year, everyone. I uh, just, just wanted to confirm that uh, there was the guidance from the Finance Committee to uh, bring this forward to the board later this month. Yes. Yes. Is that the crystals behind you? It is. Okay. Wish I was there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's uh, over 100 degrees right now. So. <laughs> <laughs> When are you coming back? Uh, be in the office on the 17th. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. We'll see everyone at the board meeting. Okay. I'll get it out there. Okay. Moving on. All right, well, moving on. I get to uh, I'll introduce. I'll study. Yep. Okay. I'm going to discuss uh, the Citos groups. Uh, a biochar technology pilot study that's been proposed to the district and give you a minute here and I will share my screen. 
for a short presentation. Uh, joining us today uh, at the Finance Committee is uh, Mayo Ryan of the CITOS Group. So um, we can uh, ask a variety of questions for Ryan, and I'll probably ask him to uh, introduce the, um, uh, or help me introduce the CITOS Group team. But anyway, uh, the CITOS Group has um, made a proposal to uh, the uh, Regent to consider a pilot study uh, around um, producing a biochar. And uh, that's what I'll present to you today. So I'm going to kind of walk through who's involved, uh, what is biochar, where it, would the study be located, um, how is biochar produced, why one would want to produce biochar, and uh, when the pilot study would occur. So uh, jumping right in to um, the who, let me see here, slideshow. Everybody see the uh, screen? Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, Who's involved? Well, it's the CITOS group. And the CITOS group is partnering with uh, the Keith Day Company, the um, compost operator for Regen Monterey and um, Monterey Pacific, which is a, a Monterey County um, oriented uh, firm uh, supporting the ag industry and one of uh, Keith Day's uh, long term customers and a company called Applied Gaia, uh, which is an equipment manufacturer. Uh, the, the Citos Group um, is led by its founder and CEO, Mayo Ryan, who's joining us today, um, together with uh, Sheila Kiger, who um, is the patent holder and uh, one of the active members in the board of directors. Um, you want to introduce James, uh, Ryan? Sure, good morning. Uh, yeah, thanks, Guy. Can you hear me well enough? Yes. Like, yeah. Yes. Great. Um, so uh, James McPhail is, uh, lives in Bath in the United Kingdom. Uh, James was uh, the first person in Europe to start a carbon market 10 years ago under the name Carbon Gold and has been consulting uh, for the last 10 years on carbon markets. Um, and helped uh, consult with uh, our ver verification partner, which is called Pro Earth in Helsinki. Uh, Pro was just acquired by NASDAQ last summer. Uh, so James is our carbon marketing officer and a, a real guru in, in, in the carbon market. Alongside nice. James, the next uh, picture is of Steve McIntyre. Uh, Monterey Pacific Vineyards is based in Soledad. Uh, Steve started the company with his wife, Kim, 30 years ago. They farm a little over 17,000 acres of premium wine grapes from uh, Paso Robles uh, up to the Santa Cruz Mountains. And seven years ago, started using biochar in their vineyards. Um, they have a, a need of at least 10,000 tons of biochar per year, which they cannot, uh, they just can't find that kind of supply. And they're one of Keith Day's largest customers. Uh, Keith makes about 50,000 tons of compost, um, I, I think, out of the facility right there at Regen, and Steve is his largest customer, uh, taking about 30,000 tons of that per year. Next is Doug Beck. Yeah, Doug Beck is, uh, both Doug Beck and Daryl Salm are uh, soil scientists, uh, PhDs, and they are on staff at Monterey Pacific. So Steve has two uh, in-house soil scientists. Doug led the research, the six to seven year uh, period of research on biochar and biochar and compost in vineyards. Um, that study was published this last December in conjunction with the Department of Water Resources and the Son Sonoma Ecology Center um, and uh, is a really good read. It's, it's, it's a bit uh, technical, but a great, uh, a great read about the value of biochar and compost in, in vineyards. We think the same sort of benefits uh, will present themselves in almonds and pistachios and, and really in any other crop. And then the fellow on the right is uh, Larry Mortorf. Larry is a uh, Los Angeles-based 
uh, attorney. Uh, he helped me develop the structure of the company about a year ago. Um, happened to be Jacques Cousteau's attorney and still represents the family. Um, but he's a, a really nice uh, conservationist and environment, environmentalist, and we're lucky to have him on the board. Is more of an advisory board member. Good. Thank you, Mayo. You're welcome. Who is the owner? Who is the owner of the couple of the added entity? Oh, so the, the CITOS group is, uh, is there are three owners. Um, Monterey Pacific is a partner, Applied Gaia is a partner, and I am a partner as the founder and CEO. Applied Gaia, um, the technology that we uh, intend to use is called slow pyrolysis. There are only about six or seven manufacturers of that equipment in the world. Applied Gaia is one of the oldest and has, uh, has the patents and intellectual property um, that's probably 12 to 15 years old. Uh, the owner of Applied Guy and I've been together for now almost four years in trying to develop a biochar uh, process that works for almonds, pistachios, wine grapes, compost yards. Um, and so the three owners are Monterey Pacific, uh, myself, and Applied Gaia. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and, and what is biochar? A, a biochar is a, a transformed organic matter. Uh, nature's been transforming forming it um, uh, over the millennia at uh, different points in time uh, through uh, uh, mainly temperature processes, um, but there's also a, a manufacturing, um, you know, man man control process uh, to create biochar, and uh, that uh, the the type of biochar will, will will and quality of biochar will vary based on um, the input material, uh, the um, temperatures that it's transformed in and in the environment that it's transformed in. Um, but it, it can develop some, um, some uh, uh, desirable uh, physical characteristics. And that's where the control process of, of organics tr transformation uh, into a biochar product is, is um, seeking to um, uh, produce. It's a, um, a surface area, uh, you know, on a microscopic level, it, uh, the biochar uh, is shown here in the photo. Um, and uh, all those different cells uh, represents uh, a, a lot of surface area. And uh, that, that surface area space can retain moisture, can retain uh, nutrients, and uh, also is, is uh, helpful in the stability of the carbon in the material itself. And, and that's part of the interest in biochar is that it, there is uh, some carbon um, uh, uh, sequestration and, and certainly some carbon uh, emission prevention uh, occurring um, in the creation of a biochar. Anything you'd like to add, Mayo, on that? I know you you've covered it well. It's a it's a uh, my analogy is it's a it's a coral reef for the soil. It does a whole bunch of really interesting things. Um, and uh, just in terms of surface area, it's a it's a hard metric to understand. But in in one gram, about the size of a pencil eraser, there's enough surface area to cover a football field. Um, it's one of the quality metrics, but uh, it's a it's a really interesting. Uh, uh, material does wonderful things for soil. Yeah, and here's a, a generic representation of um, what is done um, with organic materials. Uh, you know, generally in the industry, that's the upper uh, piece of the diagram uh, labeled today. Uh, today. Uh, you know, there's liquid organic waste that are going to wastewater treatment plants uh, from the communities, and uh, there's a biosolid that's created, and um, the primary use of biosolids is a disposal to a landfill. That 
uh, will no longer be a permitted activity uh, per Senate Bill 1383, you know, starting in January of 2025. Um, you know, similarly, the communities, businesses produce the waste. You know, companies like Regen Monterey are in charge of managing that waste and in implementing um, uh, the various uh, local, state, and federal regulations on uh, environmental protection and public health protection by managing those wastes. Those um, are most often uh, disposed of in a landfill, um, just like the uh, biosolids, and uh, decomposition occurs in, in that process. So those materials can contain carbon. Um, you know, they produce gases that contain carbon. Um, methane is a carbon molecule uh, with four hydrogen molecules. We use it uh, um, in the landfill gas to energy plant, destroying that, that landfill gas is a, an air pollution abatement activity. And during that activity, we, we generate renewable electricity. Um, some landfill gas escapes to the atmosphere uh, due to the, the fact that a landfill is not a, a controlled vessel with, with uh, um, finite boundaries. It is an open vessel, so it's difficult to uh, keep all the landfill gas in, in the uh, um, in landfills. So there are carbon emissions um, to the atmosphere. The lower diagram, which would show how that system uh, would change uh, with uh, creating uh, biochar, uh, biosolids uh, can be converted to a biochar. Um, there is excess heat available during that time. And uh, so uh, energy can be generated. That's the uh, a little uh, plug symbol with the green leaf next to it underneath the biochar to represent uh, energy creation. That's a possibility uh, in, in the biochar production process. Um, the biosolids type biochar material would, would likely go to the construction industry. It, it is something that's uh, starting to be used in the um, concrete uh, ready mix uh, design mixes. So um, other organic waste, um, what we're planning on at the district is uh, some wood waste, uh, either directly um, if they're appropriately sized or um, after a grinding process and the oversized materials in the grinding process um, could be used. Right, right now, we don't have um, a, a high level of beneficial reuse for that material. So this would be a, a, a way to um, raise the game on another level of beneficial reuse for, for the uh, overs that are produced in the in the wood grinding. And um, for those materials that would likely go into the agricultural process, it would, uh, the biochar would become an, an admixture to the compost and it would um, provide a, um, you know, higher quality uh, compost material that's certain ag uh, customers are, are, are desiring. Um, we, we mentioned earlier Monterey Pacific and, and the vineyards, and uh, that's, uh, that's certainly uh, one of the applications that has local interest. Um, again, it, it is a local party that's an existing customer, and having biochar would uh, kind of improve uh, um, that customer's um, Commitment to the to uh, Keith Day Company um, by having this a higher quality compost material. 
Um, it has, uh, biochar has received some um, uh, uh, approvals and certifications to in, in about 22 states um, with, uh, with the United States the Department of Agricultural uh, Agency involved. And uh, just recently, um, there was a, a standard, a uh, final standard adopted for uh, soil carbon amendment um, requirements. So uh, that that helps the, the market. Um, here's a quick view of some applications. This would kind of be the, the field development uh, uh, period of time, uh, taking a, a, a new field or a field that's being turned over for new crop uh, development and utilizing uh, biochar uh, not only um, in specific root zones, but also can be used in, in just the uh, field um, soil improvement uh, uh, approach as well. Um, here's a picture of uh, utilizing biochar in an, an existing field application. This is at a vineyard, as you can see, and the uh, tractor is pulling some um, shanks that are underground and creating a trough. Um, the shank is there uh, next, you know, in the center of the photo next to that, that green attachment. And it's uh, uh, cutting a trough that's a couple feet, you know, foot and a half to two and a half feet deep, uh, depending on the uh, application and uh, the biochar uh, compost mix is being uh, in, inserted into that trough and it's to improve water retention and nutrient retention and distribution of, of nutrients and moisture over time. Uh, where would it be done? Uh, the pilot study would, uh, is being proposed to uh, be in the compost uh, operations area. There in the um, southeast corner of uh, that compost area shown in the green highlighted area. Uh, kind of the, the advantage of of locating the pilot study, you know, at Regen site is that's where all the materials are. There's the the, the materials don't have to be trans uh, transported to other areas. So, you know, there as I mentioned, uh, the study is going to look at wood waste conversion. It'll look at uh, the uh, wood overs that are. Uh, resulting from the grinding process, how the, how those convert to a biochar. Uh, we, we also have interest in um, testing uh, the biosolids uh, and how they might be transformed um, into a biochar. And there may be some additional blending of materials uh, as part of the pilot study that will be to determine at a later time. But uh, that's kind of the general scope of uh, the proposal. You know, how is it done? Well, um, you, you have your organic feedstock uh, shown here on this diagram as the woody feedstock in the upper left or the uh, compost feedstock in the lower left. Um, you know, again, biosolids could be on this diagram. Uh, the compost or the uh, overs in the grinding process, you know, are on this um, diagram here, uh, being directed to uh, the pyrolysis reactor in the center of the page. That's where um, uh, heat is uh, injected to start a, uh, a process of pyrol pyrolysis. That'll be an electric uh, heater uh, source. Um, and once the, the process is started, it's, uh, it's maintained through the feedstock um, 
uh, delivery to the reactor. Uh, biochar is is the output there, and um, you know the uh, so for the purpose of the pilot pilot study, we'll be looking at the at the wood or organic um, feedstock biochar to be mixed with compost. The uh, biosolid biochar would be just for study purposes. This is a view of uh, one of the existing pieces of um, uh, pyrolysis equipment, the py Pyrag PX1500. It's, as you can see, it's not a, a large piece of equipment. So um, it does have limited uh, throughput capacity, uh, but it doesn't take up a lot of um, uh, land space either. Uh, excuse me. For the pilot study, uh, some newer equipment is being proposed. Uh, this utilizing the uh, applied Gaia B3 um, pyrolysis technology. This is equipment that's uh, being manufactured and um, as well, actually the manufacturing process is being completed uh, because it's gonna ship uh, before too long. And that's one of the interests that the Citrus Group had in, in contacting Regen is that um, uh, the, the ability to start a pilot study is present in, in the near future here. And they're looking uh, for a host site and uh, uh, be able to conduct the studies to uh, uh, kind of confirm and document uh, the process and the quality of the biochar. This is a diagram of that uh, applied Gaia um, equipment. It's basically there on the left, there's a feed auger that's uh, feeding a, a vessel where um, the heat treatment is uh, applied and uh, uh, syn, syn gases are produced um, and the biochar product uh, as well is produced through the pyrolysis process. Uh, the, the syn gas can, you know, is coming off at heat and can generate electricity. Uh, that's not being proposed as part of the pilot study, um, but it, it would be considered um, for a future uh, permanent uh, facility that uh, you know would be developed to kind of match scale of of, um, of of product production. This is the uh, unit in, in England where where it's being manufactured. Um, that's the ceramic. Uh, um, insulation that you're seeing, um, and the uh, that lower trough there is the uh, feedstock trough, and the um, upper uh, larger area is the uh, chamber for paralysis and, and the heat treatment. Why why biochar? Well, uh, California produces a lot of biomass. You know, up in the north of the state, which is primarily rural, you see the red colored uh, portion of the bar graphs, and there's a lot of forest material biomass. Um, down in the southern part of the state, which is uh, much more urbanized and populated, you see that municipal solid waste is, is the large uh, con contributor to uh, organic biomass. In Monterey County there at uh, the central coast, uh, you see all, almost a balanced mix of materials. Uh, there's MSW, uh, again, in, uh, Monterey County is, is really primarily a rural county with a, a few, a couple um, areas that are uh, more heavily populated. So it doesn't have a large population, thus it's not a large solid waste um, production, uh, but egg is its largest industry. 
and it's a large county with with ag and so there's a a good um uh component of of ag biomass so definitely the biomass is there to convert if uh if it's an ad adopted um uh technology it's not um exactly new there are um uh, other uh, production entities in the state and across the country, um, not necessarily for biochar though. You see the that in this this chart here is showing uh, various operations in California only, and you see that there's a half a dozen or more uh, uh, using gasifiers. So that that's not producing um, a biochar. They're they're trying to produce um, a, uh, a renewable energy and and transform the material um, for for uh, you know material management purposes. They're, those are their primary goals there. Why why choose pyrolysis? Um, you know, in nature. You know the biomass decomposes or burns. You know, and in human handling, bio biomasses are either disposed in a landfill and decomposed, or they're burned in cogen plants, and and those release carbon. So if you to reduce the carbon uh, emissions, um, one could look to to biochar and the use of pyrolysis. Uh, to sequester some of the carbon in in the biochar while creating um, uh, some elect electricity through uh, the sink gas for uh, you know reducing other sources of uh, energy that have carbon emissions. Um, it has biochar has uh, intersections with the uh, different areas of interest um, in society as represented here in the, in this figure showing the overlapping areas of interest in waste management mitigation of climate change energy production and soil improvement and i you know i might add water conservation under soil improvement because uh uh, that that too is a a uh, area of um, keen interest around the world. So it it would be one step closer to a circular economy um, and a and a higher and better use of some of our organic materials if uh, uh, we were to um, adopt this at, you know as a full scale operation. Uh, in addition. Um, there are some, at, there is an attribute, um, you know, that uh, has financial um, value to it. It's called a carbon renew, removal certificate um, or cork for short. And it is a, a, a verified process as uh, Mayo referred to earlier. Puro Earth is the entity that um, does the research and uh, does the uh, testing and certification of the qualities of biochar. And um, depending on those qualities, uh, the, a, a, a relationship to a cork um, is defined and those corks can be traded um, and marketed uh, as a financial in instrument. When would it occur? When would this pilot study occur? It, uh, um, if the Finance Committee directs staff to take it to the board, um, we, would, we would introduce it to the board um, for their consideration of approval at the January board meeting. Um, the equipment is uh, being shipped in February and uh, uh, would arrive in Monterey in March. And, uh, you know, the 
process the equipment would be set up uh, there is some permitting uh, that the citrus group would have they've already uh, started um, some coordination with the air district ar ar around a, an authority to construct permit um, there would likely be a um, a electrical permit uh, required for the the electrical connection of the equipment um, may or may not need to be a building permit for uh, landing the equipment. Um, but I think uh, there is some setup uh, that would occur in uh, first and second quarter. And uh, then the process would begin um, after commissioning and startup of the equipment. And uh, the various materials would be tested um, over that time with the pilot study being proposed to end uh, in June 30th of 2024. Uh, mentioned that the joint feasibility study that the Regen has with Monterey One Water next door and uh, the consultant that the joint agencies have retained, uh, GHD, will be studying biochar as one of um, the potential uh, organic transformation processes. Um, and having the pilot study would uh, occurring at the same time would uh, yield uh, you know, some site specific and um, you know, more current information, you know, given that this is there's new uh, equipment technology being proposed here that uh, would would inform the joint feasibility study and thus inform uh, the joint agencies on um, to what degree is there value in uh, biochar production as part of the organic waste treatment process. So um, I wanted to you know, make it clear that uh, this isn't just a standalone pilot study, that there is some uh, corollary benefits um, with other activities that the district is doing. This uh, slide is just kind of a summary of uh, the, the goals of the pilot study, uh, be to deploy a, a single unit, uh, commission and start up that unit in the second quarter of uh, this year, complete the, any necessary permitting, you know, utilize the operations of that equipment um, to allow the life cycle assessment by Pure Earth to be done on the uh, different biochars produced. Um, it would obtain operational data that uh, would help inform uh, the the operator and, and region and the air district of what might be necessary for the next air district permit, which is a permit to operate. Um, the pilot study would operate uh, at or near full production from June of 23 through June of 24. So get a year of operational experience, um, help uh, inform how SCADA system design might be uh, uh, organized uh, for multiple machines. Um, and uh, Citrus Group would uh, be the party uh, providing the uh, capital investment for, for the pilot study. Uh, and that's estimated to be about 1.2 million. This would be the relationship between the two parties. Regen would provide access to land, water, and electricity at no cost. So if any costs were incurred, those would be reimbursed. Uh, mm -hmm. We'd also provide access to uh, the biomass materials at no cost. Citrus Group you know, for the pilot study would provide the, the capital investment, deliver equipment, site improvements, utilities, and labor. They would own, operate, maintain the equipment during the pilot study, you know, ending in June 30 of 2024. 
and they would manage the pilot study, uh, collect data and report findings. So that's kind of the uh, introduction to um, the pilot study proposal. And uh, you know, the question for the finance committee is whether to be a host for the pilot study. Open Perfect, thank you questions. guys. Thank you, Mayo. Any questions? Yeah, the uh, the paralysis process sounds like it, it, it uh, consumes an, a large amount of electricity, and we we have to provide that. Is that right? You know, the system uh, the system requires very little electricity. Um, the pro pyrolysis process itself, once it's initiated, uh, the process is 24-7. Uh, so we would run this machine without stopping it for 40 days. And at, th at that point, we might take a, a two or three hour maintenance period. But the design is to run them 8,000 hours a year, 330 production days. Once the initial flame is, is initiated with a diesel burner um, and we reach temperature, then we turn that burner off and the system is what's called exothermic. It generates more energy than it requires to sustain the process. However, to answer your question, there's about uh, 10 horsepower worth of motors. There, there are two fans, two auger motors, and then the computer system that the operational system requires a, a, a feed of electricity. Um, but uh, other than that minimal amount of electricity, the system generates more energy than it consumes. The other question I have is the um, the gases that are being produced in the parallel system. Do you, what are they going to be used for again? Yeah, they're consumed within the system. Um, so we we the uh, when we take the feedstock, whether it's biosolids or municipal wood waste or almond shell or pistachio shell, it it goes through the trough, as Guy well explained. It goes through the bottom of a trough, and and we're operating at about 15 to 1600 degrees Fahrenheit in a very little or no oxygen environment. And so the feedstock itself is never catching fire, but at those temperatures, anything that's not organic is, is emitted, is, is removed from that material and, and then is consumed at, at that heat. So there is a flame and that flame combusts whatever syngases or non-organic vapors or volatile organic compounds inside the chamber. So there's very little, if any, emissions. Um, the pyreg unit, if you were to remember that picture, it had two separate, uh, it, it had a combustion chamber and then it had a trough where, where the um, material was converted or pyrolyzed. In our unit, it all happens in a single chamber. Um, it's a very efficient design. Uh, this design originated at Cornell University 12 to 15 years ago. My partner, Sheila McDonald Kiger, uh, perfected the design um, and started building the first units in Australia. Uh, this unit happens to be manufactured at the largest kiln manufacturer in Europe. It's in uh, Stoke-on-Trent in the UK. But it's a very, very efficient design with very little emissions and, and um, you know, should be able to run without problem for 8,000 8, hours a year. I have a question about um, kind of the, the overall purpose of this. What, what are you hoping to find? What would be the best results of this pilot study? What would that look like for us at the end? Well, yeah, we're, we're, we're actually interrupting a process that's already occurring. So uh, Monterey Pacific has a, a, a demand for biochar that far exceeds uh, California industry's ability to supply it. Uh, so for our... Uh, this single machine, the pilot project, will produce about 800 tons of biochar per year using 2,500 tons of, of feedstock material. Um, the need at Monterey Pacific is, uh, is 10,000 tons a year. So it would take quite a few, 10, 12 of these machines to satisfy just Monterey Pacific needs. What Monterey Pacific's been doing is buying biochar from a company called Pacific Biochar. It happened to be on that chart that Guy showed a little bit earlier. That is gasifier aft, essentially. That, that's coming from Humboldt Lumber in Humboldt County. Uh, that biochar is transported from Humboldt County to, um, to Keith's uh, facility where it is incorporated in biochar. And then that biochar compost blend is going into Monterey Pacific's vineyard developments. And when they don't have a vineyard development is going into the ongoing production practice. So what Steve at McIntyre at Monterey Pacific is hoping to do to answer your question is generate a very high quality 
biochar, which they're not getting today, to minimize the transportation costs and uh, and to essentially perfect the biochar compost uh, blend going into vineyards, almond orchards, pistachio orchards, or row crops. Uh, for every one ton of biochar we produce, we can generate three carbon removal credits and sequester carbon in soil. So not only does biochar have a great health benefit for soil, we can also sequester carbon permanently with that same application. So in terms of um, you know, climate mitigation and soil health, we're, we're kind of, it's the, it's the trifecta. It's a perfect thing to do and, and to revalue or repurpose the waste that would otherwise be going into the landfill. Mm -hmm. And we have enough source product here with our, with our wood waste. To Vast, yeah, <laughs> yes. Uh, Keith shakes his head, you know, 2,500 tons is just a, a minuscule amount of the, the material that he's, he's working with. So we have an essentially unlimited supply uh, at Regen Monterey of, of overs and wood products that uh, otherwise would either go into the landfill or compost, right? Keith, we, uh, Keith has way, way more material for us than, than we, we could possibly use. And, and yeah. the Mo Monterey One Water has about 10,000 tons per year uh, dry weight of biosolids. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So, so that has been used to make biochar before. That's that's not. Uh, we know that works. We that. do. Yeah, we we do actually. We know more about biosolids to biochar than we do about a lot of things. Uh, this is a very new industry. As I said, there are few manufacturers of the equipment globally. Um, but in Redwood City, at the Redwood City Municipal Waste Facility, a PIREG has been in operation since uh, full operation and permitted since 2018. Uh, they installed that unit in 2016. Um, and so we, we know an awful lot that uh, San Mateo County approved that uh, process in 2018. Cal EPA and the US EPA have approved that process. Uh, there's only one other slow pyrolysis unit operating in California at the Merced Airport. Um, it's not a scalable machine. Um, one of our criteria for this machine, uh, machine selection is it, it's relatively inexpensive, so there's an economic value. Um, it's robust, but it's scalable. We can put two or 10 of these machines side by side um, to uh, match the output, uh, or I guess the feedstock input. Um, and so what we're proposing is let's, let's put a machine at Regen Monterey, um, and interrupt the system that's already taking place. Biochar is coming from Northern California. Um, it's being incorporated into compost. That compost is going into Monterey Pacific vineyards. Uh, we're just essentially taking that operation and doing it in-house. Mm -hmm. So just a reminder, um, the, the, the model that they're sending out here would process about 9,000 tons in that kind of period, which is not a whole lot. It's mm -hmm. not a, a big amount and it would probably produce about 3,000 tons. So it's about a one to three. Mm -hmm. of biochar so it's not the scale we're looking for but it is uh, going to give us insight to um, having a carbon neutral process in 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 the composting piece um, how how does it dovetail with our cast that's coming in the future how does it dovetail with our feasibility study how do, how do we introduce biosolids to it and have an out for that as well so it gives us a period of time and the big interest for me was the 1.2 million that Regen doesn't put into the kitty for the results of that during that process. So there was a few things that caught my attention. One was the material and what it does. Um, there's a right now with um, the process we use for agan and we water and we produce um, high nitrates that seep into the wells and gives us well problems and water issues. There is a potential in the future that if they spread enough of this biochar in some of those areas that it would retain some of those nitrates that are seeping into the water. So there's a whole bunch of positive items that I'm really honed in on that tie to our strategic plan over the next eight years that we can really, really get some knowledgeability and some context to making decisions that we all need to make in the future around. So but our position has been really, mine has been very strong since the day I met Mayo um, and and, and, and Dr. Doug as well, he came in and they, they really gave us an overview. And over time, it's gotten more. We, we did sign a um, non-disclosure agreement as, as the best of our ability with the knowledge that we're gonna gain through here. But I think it is a huge benefit uh, for what we do moving into the future. One is the design of having a carbon, carbon negative 
product that we can create here that would offset some of our other operations. Um, so there's a lot of things that we we could be vested in as we watch this pilot take 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 course. So I'm pretty excited about the, not only the technology but what it means for us around 1383 feasibility with Monterey One Water uh, and everything else that's still going to continue to come down from legislation. Does one Monterey Water want to have a uh, financial interest in this at all? Um, we don't know at this point yet. We we would have to kind of see. Uh, the bio biosolids that would be available at, at some point, and it is in our feasibility study. It is they are working on um, a co-digestion pro project that they have slated and been approved at, at Monterey One Water. So I, I think it's really just starting to just kind of touchy and feel what are the results, what are the benefits for us to make a decision on a larger scale. But in and, this this particular uh, process. That we're talking about today, Monterey Water One doesn't have a piece of that. No. Okay. And roughly, I know they're they're picking up the capital costs and all that stuff. Roughly, what is the value of the dollar value of the services that we're going to be providing to? Mm -hmm. Absent the space and the we have, we haven't really looked at what the lease value. Mm -hmm. We 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 talked about a few items that I really wanted to make sure that the Citos and Mails Company was. Um, we're aware of one is that we have a maintenance cost to just come into the road. We have maintenance costs to obtain the trees. We have our cost to keep litter and debris free of the areas and then any of the other siting costs, what it is, and the electrical component piece, which is we think it's very nominal on the scale. But I think on, on the scale, um, it'd be cost, new, cost neutral for us on this pilot scale as we were to look at a bigger endeavor to scale it up and process more, we, at that point, we could probably really dive into what is what is gonna be the benefit for Regen Monterey. And so we haven't abandoned that. That was a full disclosure right before um, we decided we wanted to bring this item to the finance committee is, I, as I entered into this position a year ago, those were some of the findings that I found difficult is that we had people on the property that were not um, contributing to maintenance costs, litter costs, um, you know, support costs. So we, we see a lot of that and we want to make sure that those are evident as we move forward with any other larger scale that we decide to do, uh, that we would want something that would return some sort of the investment for being here and cited close to the material. So yes, it really kind of addressing the concerns of what is the return on investment for us as well. Does Keith Day have a financial interest in this, pro in this uh, project? Uh, he yes, does. he does. He does because it, it really what he's doing is now he's could meet the full demand for Monterey Pacific during the pilot project. He won't be able to make, meet that demand because we're only going to process a certain amount of materials. But at the end of the day, um, we may see the other usages for for this product that could go into uh, the concrete that's being uh, made by Don Shaven on, on site as well. So I think there's a lot of classes that we can look at where. where um, we, we could benefit financially from this here at Regen. One, if I may interrupt, just uh, one of the benefits that Keith Day sees is his ability taking our byproduct heat, which it, in the pilot study we don't have a use for. It can be used to either generate electricity or can run a boiler. And what Keith would like to do is to pasteurize food waste in order to uh, have it go into compost. Today he can't do that. But that fits in with SB 1383 as well. We may be able to use our byproduct heat to um, take that food waste out of the landfill and get it into compost and ultimately into soils. And then, uh, you know, prov providing an analogy for um, Director Alaska's uh, question, uh, you know, the uh, soil amendment products at the local hardware store. Um, <laughs> the, one can buy. Uh, uh, different grades, quality grades of a soil amendment uh, product. And the higher quality products come at a higher cost. And that's essentially um, uh, the analogy for the biochar amendment of an, an existing compost, you know, is, is that now you're creating a, a product that has additional characteristics um, over the compost itself and those have value to the end user 
and the end user is willing to pay more for that. And, um, you know, that creates customer loyalty when you have a, a unique product and product mix um, available for a local market that has uh, interest and in, in needs for that type of quality product. Is, is, I have a question, is biochar, can it be used in certified organic farming yet? Yes, it can. It's, it's, it's uh, as a product, it, it's not a, uh, it's, it's pure carbon. Um, it's interesting. I mean, what, we just love the idea that we're working with Regen Monterey or, or hope to. Steve and uh, McIntyre at Monterey Pacific, they're one of the largest regenerative farming vineyard operations in the country. Steve made the decision to convert to regenerative agriculture many, many years ago. Um, and so he's moving away from a traditional or conventional farming practice, which relies upon, you know, petroleum-based synthetic nutrients. Um, and so regenerative is cover crops, uh, no-till, which they practice, and the use of biochar as a replacement for, you know, a synthetic or petroleum-based nutrient. Um, he just can't get enough of it. And so the idea that we may, you know, what Steve is doing regeneratively in, in vineyards um, you know, we may be able to help facilitate uh, regen and repurposing, uh, you know, overs and wood waste and hopefully even biosolids to biochar and then get back that, get that biochar back in the vineyard. It's a perfect closed loop of, of sort of the carbon cycle. It, it, we couldn't design this any better. Um, it's, it's really an ideal group of partners that are involved. To, to Kim's question, I think is vineyards, I understand why you want to do that, but for row crops, can you use, uh, can, can biochar be used as an amendment to, to uh, for, for farming of, of row crops? Yes, sir, it can. Uh, absolutely. It, it can be used in gardens and landscape. Um, there's a group, uh, the Carbon Neutral Cities Alliance, is promoting use of biochar in urban landscapes. Uh, and uh, it can be used in dairies as well. So for livestock, um, California Department of Food and Ag approved on January 1st, 2021, the use of biochar for poultry and cattle feed. They've been using it in Europe for 10 years. It reduces methane emissions, but milk quality and milk yields are up. So there's a whole bunch of interesting uses. Our goal is to provide a very high quality, adjustable biochar for various soil types. Um, I'm a farmer and a uh, uh, cotton grower, wine grape grower. And so Steve and I are aligned on, on the need for a high quality biochar that can be customized for a specific soil type. At Monterey Pacific, they farm on very different soils, pure sand or pure clay. And uh, at this process, we can design a biochar for specific soil types. If we were interested in just generating dollars or generating electricity, we'd, we'd apply a gasifier to this process. But our goal is ultimately soil health in agricultural operations. So uh, thus the machine that we're deploying, uh, the applied Gaia B300 slow pyrolysis machine. So what's the next step? Take it to the board. Take it to the board? Yes. Yeah, I agree. And presentation in January? Yes. Okay. Uh, might have some information ready for, you know, our, our quantify a little bit what our part of this might be over time. Sure. And the length of the, uh, how long is this, how long is this study going to go on and, and what happens at the end of it? Do they pick up the stuff and go home, or do we have to buy it, or you know, <laughs> or put it in a rock and send it to Saturn? <laughs> Our goal ultimately is to uh, is to construct, go through this one year uh, study project, and determine together. Our mm -hmm. ultimate goal, our 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 most favorite outcome, is a permanent three machine plant at the compost operation, and perhaps something similar at Monterey One, where um, we we've. we've standardized uh, a, a three machine plant where three of these machines are side by side, but this will be the first implementation of that um, in the US anyway. There are only a handful of these machines operating in the whole country, maybe three or four throughout the United States. A lot of eyes would be on this project. So we, we hope to gain some valuable knowledge, air emissions data, quality data on the biochar and, uh, and align our goals with yours. We want this to be a, a win-win for everybody. Does this uh, machine have to be enclosed within a structure or can it be outside? The, the machine's, great question. The machine is transportable. It fits on the back of a 40-foot, it, it will be shipped in a 40-foot container. Um, 
And so it's somewhat transportable. Ultimately, you know, it could be uh, utilized on a roll truck and, and deposited in an almond orchard or a vineyard where we might have wood waste that needs to be pyrolyzed. But uh, it, it, we're going to set it down and, and uh, it's not a permanent not a permanent installation other than the small amount of electricity it can it's completely self-contained it's got its own diesel tank its own water tank um, and we could if we needed to generate uh, electricity with a generator that's not very carbon friendly and would hurt our life cycle analysis with pearl earth ideally we plug it in and run it 24 7 8 000 hours a year okay great okay yes Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. You. You're welcome. Thank. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Next item. Next item. Are yeah. oh, we the person of today? Speedy today? No. No. Ah, oh, sorry. What are we doing? We loaded it up. Yeah. We loaded it up. <laughs> what are we going to do today? We give ourselves many a work for the next month or two. Okay. Last next item is the. Uh, that's already the surplus of water. Okay. The, uh, the wow factor on this is very low. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, we're asking uh, for approval to surplus uh, three pieces of equipment. Um, the last page of your handout is a photo of the piece of equipment. The dozer on the list was replaced last year. So um, the, um, the loader. Is a unit that was a replacement unit arrived last week. So um, so that'll be surplus. And then the last, the pickup truck uh, is an older unit that lost a major component that doesn't warrant replacement. So so it's pretty straightforward. Three pieces of equipment that have been replaced that we just need to dispose of. What are, I don't have that picture. What are you? Picture. No, but I saw. You saw the nice slide. <laughs> <laughs> that was a brand new one. And then the lower and then a bigger one. I think that these are. You need to dispose of them and what are your, you got to sell them or what are you going to do? Well, going to say the, the pickup truck really has no value because as you see in the picture, the bent off end, it's got. A bad engine, so we'll just scrap that. The other two pieces of equipment do have value. Heavy equipment, uh, there's a big market for it. Uh, so we're looking at proposals from Richie Brothers, who's the largest um, heavy equipment auctioneer in the, pretty much in the world. And they see a lot of value. They can buy just the highest dollar for it. So we may do, we may test the water with Richie Brothers on one piece of equipment, which would be the loader. And that if that yields some success to the dozer, that dozer has a high market value to be sell value because of the waste handler package on it. So it's very desirable in South America. I mentioned to your predecessor uh, mm -hmm. there's an operation called bigiron.com. Yeah, so same, you... same type of guy. Okay, good. Yeah. Richard Brother Iron Planet, they merged, which made them the largest auctioneer yeah. in the world. Every every Wednesday, all over the all over the United yeah, States. Same concept. <laughs> so, just need your approval to take this to the board. Sure. Sure. Yes. Okay. Free. <laughs> Thank um, you, Jake. Uh, four, five. Upgrade on joint uh, joint feasibility study for organic waste production. If I could read, Mr. Guy, would you like to give the the background on the update of Michael Grid. Sure, just pulling up a, a short presentation. Does everyone see that on the screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great. Um, so the, yeah, this is uh, just a progress update for the joint feasibility study. Uh, you know, the, between the joint agencies, Monterey One Water and Regen Monterey. It would be January 4th of 2023. We, do, we didn't fast forward a year. <laughs> um, so the, uh, the joint feasibility study has kind of three components. The, 
organic processing, uh, organic waste processing, you know, assessing the highest and best use of, of the organic waste and the waste byproducts that uh, the two agencies have. Um, it's a possibility that you know, uh, some of those processing alternatives can create energy. So um, that would be a form of renewable energy and, and renewable energy like solar and wind um, are part of this joint feasibility study. And then the third category is uh, potentially having a microgrid uh, connecting the two um, uh, agencies that uh, you know transmit that energy and help manage and distribute the the energy the, that is produced, either by you know destructing what what organic waste or waste byproducts like landfill gas, or uh, by collecting you know uh, solar or wind energy. Um, and you know there's this is a study. It's, it's intended to assess um, what preferred options might be to one or both agencies. And you know, from those recommendations, that's where projects might get formed, you know, where uh, the boards um, either separately or collectively identify projects um, and approve projects to proceed. So it's, it's, it's not, it, you know, it, it has, the, the study has limitations. No final decisions, it's just identifying, um, uh, you know, higher and better uses of waste and, and uh, um, you know, extending the beneficial use cycle further, you know, closer to what a circular economy might uh, uh, identify. You know, for the joint feasibility study, we did uh, spend the first half of the year writing uh, a request for proposal and uh, then issuing it. And we got a lot of interest uh, from a variety of parties. Um, eventually made a selection in September uh, for GHG um, to represent the, the two agencies on the feasibility study. Um, their work uh, really is just getting started in December um, and consisting of uh, getting to know each of the sites, each of the facilities, requesting information from each of the facilities. So it's really um, existing information collection. And um, that should end here in January and uh, transition into getting into the assessments, all the various assessments. Um, GHD uh, is a selected consultant. Uh, they will be uh, co-managed by um, myself for, for Regen Monterey and for a, um, a lead from Monterey One Water, which I believe will be the uh, assistant general manager, uh, Tamsin uh, McNary. And um, we will, the two of us will be joined by Black and Veach, who's been retained on a, um, you know, staffing contract uh, to help represent uh, the two agencies in coordinating and managing the, uh, the technical consultant GHG on implementing the feasibility study. You know, I guess um, before I go into um, the grants, I, I want to kind of, uh, you know, just reconnect the, the finance committee that there's overlapping topics. You know, the, the feasibility study, you know, has a variety of topics in it. As I mentioned in the prior presentation, Assessing biochar as one of the processing technologies is part of the feasibility study. Um, 
you know, uh, the co-digestion of organic waste is one of the topics in the feasibility study. Um, Monterey One Water has received a grant to improve the digestion equipment at the regional treatment facility next door. Uh, so that that equipment has the capacity to handle um, higher solid or you know organic waste that are in a liquid form. Uh, that grant uh, was just awarded, I believe, in November. Um, it's a four point two million dollar grant, um, and you know the total project costs are you know just over six million dollars estimated. That equipment can handle higher solids delivered at the headworks, you know, at the front of the treatment facility. Um, there's also going to be an, an, an injection uh, receiving station, you know, at the digesters that can receive uh, pre-processed you know, organic waste slurries, you know, directly from mobile trucks. Uh, that kind of um, operation is being done at the Carmel area wastewater districts plant. I believe um, the Pebble Beach Company has some uh, uh, back of uh, uh, restaurant equipment that uh, processes um, organic waste uh, right at their sites and uh, that uh, into a organic slurry and that organic slurry is delivered to the Carmel area wastewater plant. And uh, so that, that type of um, facility is part of this grant that provides two different pathways of uh, High solid organics coming to the uh, to the wastewater treatment plant, you know, either through you know incinerators in your homes and businesses, you know, processing organics, or you know by specific specific commercial units that process organics and and transport those by mobile trucks. A third op option, you know, not in this. Cal Recycle Grant would be, you know, any processing of organic waste at, at Regen. Um, you know, Regen uh, gets, you know, close to you know, 8,000 plus tons a year of food waste. Regen could have processing equipment to uh, process that into a slurry, and that slurry could be delivered to um, M1W. So it just gives you an example uh, that that there are projects that are occurring, you know, outside of the feasibility study, you know, at, at the same time. Um, you know, another example of the of a, a project not listed here on this slide is the um, uh, covered aerated static pile compost grant that the um, that the uh, district has received. You know, hey, that I just want to point out for the directors here is that on the Cal Recycle grant that was awarded, so Monterey Well Water does have a project that's been approved. Regen Monterey does not have a project approved associated to the Cal grant um, that was awarded. So we don't have a project that's been approved. approved. We, we want to make sure that Monterey One Water hears us clearly on what our concerns are. One is that we have a feasibility that's running in tandem with their cold digestion. So, you know, they do have interest, like I say, in some material going over there for a slurry feed, but we, ha we have not uh, agreed to it. We, we have entertained it. We'll continue those discussions around it, but we have not brought any project associated to the cold digestion to the board. So we just want to make sure that's extremely clear because that's where um, what's important for us. One is that feasibility is going to take its you know six to twelve month course to give us some business cases 
at the same time, we have cold digestion that's running kind of in front of that. So we need to make sure that in any agreement that we're still uh, protecting the, what we have been approved for by the board. And that's one to go out and get the feasibility results to build business cases. The other one is if we do anything, there has to be clear um, disclosure to the board that cold digestion is running out in front of the head of the game. And if we do make a decision to have a project approved by us, that, that there's a full disclosure in that line item. And the other one is that we want a full disclosure to Monterey One Water that at a point that uh, we get results from fe feasibility, we want to have a, a way to pivot. But we don't want to be locked in. We don't want to be permanently locked into a design that doesn't give us the best business case. So those are two big points that cause, uh, you know, a little influx between the two agencies is they're ready to run. They got 6.1 million ready to go. We want to make sure what's important to us and what's been approved is being observed and acknowledged by Monterey One Water. Uh, and so those discussions will continue, but I really want to make sure that we really understand that that piece is cold digestion is running ahead and saying, hey, we could do all of this. You know, we got some grant money. There is is uh, grant money available for Regen if we decided we wanted to create that slurry, but we have to get it approved. There has to be disclosure. And most importantly, there has to be understanding from Monterey One Water Agency, what's been approved by our board and what we want them to nurture and consider in the decision making. And that still has to be what's important to our agency along with, with theirs. So there's that balance of it's important for mine, maybe not so important for us, but how do we make that balance so that we can continue to work together as partners? And, that, and that's why it's important to, to distinguish between a study and a project. Correct. The, the study has been approved by both boards and it's, its purpose is for the assessment of a variety of opportunities and resulting in recommendations for which opportunities to pursue. Those, those may become projects in the future. Uh, you know, existing projects are separate from the study and they, they'll be done separately by each agency. Um, Un until there's uh, sufficient uh, uh, information uh, shared and uh, collaborated on to, to change the trajectory of the study. The, this item really talks about three things, organic waste processing, microgrid, and renewable energy. These are kind of sort of separate. Uh, there's, some, there's some overlap, but generally speaking, we've been talking about organic waste processing. In, in the main, are we, is, is there any, on the microgrid, is there any kind of a update on that? So we won't know until we get feasibility results okay. back. And I think that's- well, yeah. yeah, no, it's a, it's a uh, that's for the microgrid for sure. Um, it, uh, but it's, a, it's another element here that reinforces the point of, of keeping the study separate from projects. Um, the 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 feasibility study is going to evaluate microgrids, and you know in general uh, potentially three different sizes of microgrids: a small, a medium, and a large. And the scopes of those are very different. That's the study, um, and uh, you know recommendation will come out of that study. Um, you know, in in July or or you know August of this of this year. So this, this Se our, separate this our, separately, the, the district our, <laughs> the, the district is also constructing an electrical connection with M one W right now as part of a project. The uh, AWPF medium voltage project is um, was awarded is under contract with the contractor um you know will connect the two entities electrically and the and the regen board has authorized a uh, modification of that design to to incorporate uh, functionality to allow it to act as a microgrid so it will uh, when completed 
it'll it'll be the smallest of the small version of a microgrid. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But the feasibility study will also result in its own recommendations. <clears throat> uh, we'll we'll have a microgrid in place at, at a very small scale, but we will, we will from the feasibility study we will get a vision for how big to grow it. So uh, I think that's it's a good discussion to, you know, recognize the difference between the study and and the projects and and um, I, you know what what Felipe is referring to is you know that both parties understand that the purpose of this study is to to identify future investment opportunities and to to make a decision before assessing those future opportunities in one, any one area is not what was signed up for. Felipe, I don't think this is this item is ready to go to the full board. This is it, it is not. It's just a, it's an update. I have another meeting today with Monterey One Water, and it's really to continue for me to host those indifferences of we have feasibility approved. We do not have code digestion approved. Mm -hmm. We want to support your endeavor for six point one million dollars. Um, but you know, there's there is items we want considered. One is that we do have the feasibility going on. And do we have a, a position to pivot when we get those results? If not, how do we how do I bring something back that bypasses what we already approved? It does not make sense. So those are the discussions that are going on. They're, they're really distinguishing one from the other. And how do we continue to be agency to agency partners to help with the endeavors? But we cannot lock down our uh, our own agency to support their agency at the same time. So the discussions have, have raised eyebrows of, okay, what is the appropriate course of action? Well, I'm not taking any course on cold digestion until they acknowledge my concerns that we do have a feasibility that's been approved and we do want to see results and we want to have the ability to pivot on that. So we don't want to uh, permanently make a decision that bypasses feasibility. Otherwise, why would we continue along with feasibility? So those are the discussions that are occurring. The, you know, the awareness around them is, is there. So we want to make sure that we continue that path that they're separate. And when we meet with uh, consultants that have been approved, like uh, GHD, uh, that they're aware that we want those completely separate. As, as soon as we have a discussion where they start reeling them in together, it really confuses our audience and our folks that are helping us make those critical decisions. So we really want to make sure that those, yeah, and, those are being kept separate as we discuss them. Going ahead with the biochar that we talked about, is that going to be any kind of an issue with the it, it, it shouldn't because it's a pilot project that will contribute <laughs> to the of findings that gave a, gives us an option to say, oh, one year, the, the, the pilot is over. It didn't give us the results we're looking for. Worst case scenario, pack up your bags, take your skin with you. Or best case scenario is, hey, it all worked. It yeah. really does something for us and it's going to create a line of revenue. And we want three more machines. So it may create that pathway. And feasibility may, may come back with results that align themselves. But that's just reassurance for us going through, through that process and making sure that we're keeping them separate. I just want to make sure we were doing something that would somehow be as firm. Correct. Yeah. The main thing is that we have ability to pivot. So it's not that we don't want to do anything until we get feasibility. It's we want ways out and we want acknowledgement around what's been important for our agency. And one is to get those results of feasibility to tell us where do we want to use gas? Where do we want to send electricity? What is the, the best revenue getter for us in, in those endeavors? And we, with whatever projects we do in alignment with feasibility, we want to make sure we have a pivot option to get out or to continue. Sounds good. Yeah. And in regards to the transparency element um, uh, that Felipe referred to, um, there was disclosure to M1W during the Cal Recycle grant application process um, that uh, the decision around regions uh, participating in producing organic slurry was uh, going, you know, going to come as a result of the feasibility study. And um, 
there was another disclosure that the organic waste that region has uh, may not meet the new ton criteria that the grant uh, application or the grant process was referring to. So there were a couple um, items of disclosure there, and you know M1W decided to to move ahead um, on the grant uh, in, in the prevailing interest there was uh, getting the plant upgraded to have the capacity to handle higher solids and um, you know and have that newer equipment as part of their operations. There's there's uh, a, quite a bit of um, operational interest, you know, for that. And that's really what caused them to make the final decision to go ahead with the application, even though they had been advised by Regen, um, you know, to uh, the lack of commitment that uh, that Regen has, you know, um, pending the feasibility wow. study outcome. Anyway, uh, you know, that's about the extent of the update there, you know, the EPA grant that's shown here was previously awarded. Um, it'll be um, now um, uh, implemented with, with GHG's work. So that's what um, the, the two parties were waiting on is to have a consultant who would implement the, the work under that grant which is a small piece of the feasibility study work. So there's a lot, there's co-alignment there with that grant. And then we, um, we also uh, were awarded some additional consulting time from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado. And so um, we will be um, integrating uh, their input as the uh, GHD you know, gets further into the feasibility study, gets beyond this uh, site review process that's at the front end of the study. So that's really the up update at this time. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Ian is used for our consumption, not for the board. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. GM communication. I have a few. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank the social committee and all the employees for the contributions they were able to raise through the raffle for our Christmas holiday event, uh, over $3,500. And we had two organizations, um, two stems of the Salvation Army that we distributed. One was for housing and for rough times to help support rents. Uh, so we contributed on behalf of the employees and helped with the social committee to get us guidance. Uh, uh, over $3,500 to the Salvation Army in 2022. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, I also wanted to cover um, the customer response to our closure for, for that day on the third. And so the responses for the early closure from customers were delightful responses. They were okay with it. They really, um, uh, really had high value for our employees to have the opportunity to attend. So when scale house attendance was conveyed, I said, oh, you get to go too? Yep, I do. So it was appreciative on, on, on support of the closure from the folks that we, we vetted this well in a month in advance. We had a sign at the gate. We had a sign at the entrance. We would move it at end times. Uh, we were able to put other comments under while we had the sign. So we, we felt very um, fortunate that the board approved the opportunity for everybody to attend. We had a great time at the event. Uh, and we raise money for the community at the same time. So really good responses from um, our customers. I also wanted to thank uh, the operations team and, and the engineering. They conducted two um, um, inspections that we came through. We had the Central Coast inspectors come in. Uh, and then we had the LEA come in shortly after. And uh, through this, all with nature taking its course. And both of them found... Uh, no follow-up items or um, violations in, in our practice of the landfill. So really, really good job, you know, with the environments and the elements and then getting engineering and, and landfill operations to, to, to do a, a very nice uh, sequence of 
making sure that everything is being fulfilled and that we don't have no violations. Uh, it was a great way to end the year off. And it, it, it did come in a stressful time where we were dealing with a lot of water management. So hats off to David, Katie, Sananda, Guy, uh, and Randy and his team, Jay, uh, all the contributions that you guys did for us to, to pass those inspections with flying colors, uh, even when we had elements playing a role and havoc on everything else that we do around here other than our normal operations. And the, the last item I have is we did receive a President Special Acknowledgement Award from SDRMA. Uh, the President Special Acknowledgement Award is to recognize members with no pay claims during the prior five consecutive program years in the Property and li Liability Program A. A paid claim for the purpose of the recognition represents the first payment on an open claim during the same period and excludes property claims. Congratulations on your excellent claims record. So really, really good job to the entire operation, keeping people safe, going home with all their limbs intact and being happy with their families at the end of the day. So we're pretty excited that we wanna be able to continue this trend of a great safety culture and great safety participation from all the employees. The engagement is outstanding. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration between managers, supervisors, leads and frontline employees. So we're seeing all that really, really come together uh, and as it's done over the last several years around the safety component. So, so thank you to the team and everybody that's listening today. They didn't drop your returns. Uh, I think they give us some credits uh, going into the next year, so that that'll help us with, with our cost as well. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Uh, discuss future dead items. I don't have any. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know them? I do not. All right. Closed session. We have a closed session. We have one. Yes, we, we, we have two items. Okay. You're going to kill the mic? I will.